Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now if you buy an i5-11400 with new UHD 730 graphics or an 11500 with UHD 750 graphics then you'll be getting much better iGPU performance than you would have done with 10th gen i5 chips. Both of these however will still fall short of the Vega 8 and 11 iGPUs found inside Ryzen APUs but what about this? This is the Athlon 3000G. Despite having way less processing power than the new i5-11400, the onboard Vega 3 graphics do still put up a fight in 2021. So can this 2-core, 4-threaded chip be Intel's latest 6-core offering in terms of onboard graphics performance? Let's find out. Big thanks again to CCL for letting me play with this 11400. They sent this to me to test out. CCL Online is my go-to choice for PC components, monitors, everything PC related. Once again, I'll leave a link down in the description because I highly recommend them. What I'll do here then is show you a snippet of gameplay from both the 11400 and 3000G and then I'll show you a comparative table of frame rates for a more accurate look at performance because sometimes the gameplay you see isn't always the full story so I've put everything in a graph for convenience. If we start with GTA 5 then, and despite the Athlon having just two physical cores, it runs the game respectively at 80% of 1080p. The onboard graphics are the limiting factor here, maxing out at 99 to 100% usage. This will always be the case. The same can be said of the UHD 730 graphics found inside the i5. Despite the extra CPU cores and overall power, the game didn't really run any better here because of the aforementioned GPU limitation. Honestly, I was expecting a bigger difference, and if anything, this is a testament to the 3000G, though I'm glad to see that Intel's integrated graphics have been much improved over last gen. In Red Dead Redemption 2, we see another good effort from the Athlon. The game isn't playable, but to be honest, I didn't expect it to achieve much more than 10 FPS, even at 75% of 1080p. Taking a stroll or run through Valentine always seems to put pressure on any system. The 11400 did marginally better this time around, with two more frames on average, as well as slightly improved percentile lows. Still, it's not a really playable experience and dropping to 50% res scale is needed for closer to 30 FPS. Here is how the two CPUs compared in terms of their respective integrated performance. Again, things are closer than I thought, but when the GPU is the bottleneck, any spare CPU power is going to waste. And that goes for both chips. In The Witcher 3, both CPUs performed okay in terms of average figures, but overall things were pretty stuttery. In and around Novigrad, the game hovers around 30 FPS with the AMD Athlon, but it doesn't quite maintain that figure overall as an average. The i5, however, averages at least 30 FPS, but the game still stutters quite a bit, and because of this, it can be quite difficult to enjoy. A 30 frames per second cap may be a good idea to implement here, so that the frame dips don't feel as significant. Here is the comparative table, which finally shows the UHD 730 graphics pulling ahead, though they do suffer just as much as the Athlon's integrated Vega 3 graphics in terms of unwanted frame drops. In Fallout 4, the game did well on the Athlon, and this actually proved to be the more pleasant experience gaming-wise, and I'll tell you for why. Although the average FPS turned out to be lower than it was with the Core i5, the percentile figures were higher. Here's how the i5 footage looked by comparison. It appears to be doing just as well, but it was a lot less smooth overall. Looking at the frame rate table, and this highlights the performance differences quite well. Despite the Core i5's higher average, I'd rather play the game with the Athlon because it remained smoother. Average frame rates aren't always everything, especially if the game is dropping frames all over the place. Still, 
the new UHD 730 graphics did do okay. And it is early days for the drivers as well. We may see some improvements as time goes on. Finally then, it's Overwatch. For a smooth experience here, you're going to need to utilize either a lower native resolution or you will want to make use of the resolution scaling option, preferably at 50%. 75% is also fine, but there will be more drops. The footage here looks way worse than it was because the recording played havoc on CPU usage, and in reality, the frame rate averaged over 100 FPS, which I think is still pretty impressive for the Athlon. The i5 averaged exactly the same. It did exhibit better percentile figures here with the i5. It's probably safe to assume then that the better UHD 750 graphics found in the 11500 will outperform the Athlon's Vega 3, but as far as the UHD 730 GPU goes, the more cut down iGPU variant, well, it's not significantly better, despite having the extra CPU cores. While this two core chip will be weaker than the i5 11400 in pretty much every other aspect, gaming wise it does just as well without a discrete GPU. And to be honest, going into this, I didn't expect that at all. Now obviously these performance figures may differ depending on which game you're playing, but we were certainly seeing a pattern starting to emerge here. In terms of The Witcher 3, well I think it starts to use more CPU power in and around Novigrad, but as I said before, I'm not sure if this would make a significant difference with these tests because the GPUs were holding both chips back. I'm actually quite surprised by today's results, and hopefully there'll be a few more tests like this posted on YouTube by other people as well, just so we have something to compare these results to. I've seen a few Vega 8 and 11 comparisons um, tested against the 750 integrated graphics and the Vega always pulls ahead. But the Vega 3, for its flaws, certainly can put up one hell of a fight in 2021. And in comparison to the UHD 730, it does okay by me. This has been the UHD 730 and Vega 3 iGPU comparison then. Let me know what you think of the results down below. If you enjoyed this one, well, Hopefully you can leave a like on this video. If you didn't enjoy this one, well, leave a dislike. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. Let me know if you want to see any other comparisons or more tests with the i5. Big thanks again to CCL for letting me test out this chip. Link to the website in the description. And hopefully I'll see you all in the next one because I've got a little story about a 6700 XT that, uh, yeah, you'll have to find out in the next video, but... This week has certainly been an interesting one. Thank you as always, and I'll see you again very soon.